Okay, well, I'm going to launch in because we have a lot to unpack in this little bit of time. So welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining. Um, <clears throat> my name is Mac McFarland. I am the executive director of Converge 45, and I operate an uh, exhibition space in my backyard with my partner, Ariana Jacob, called Congress Yard Projects. Um, and it's really my pleasure to welcome you to the Ford Family Foundation's Critical Conversations Convening on Curating in 2020 and Beyond. Um, <clears throat> before I begin, I want to uh, read a statement uh, of acknowledgement of whose lands we operate on. The Ford Family Foundation activities and partners are located on the traditional homelands of indigenous people. Since the arrival of European explorers, the indigenous people of Oregon have repeatedly been dispossessed of their land by settler colonialism, including the United States government, and their policies to forcibly remove the indigenous populations to reservations in Oregon and around the country. Today, the descendants of Oregon's first people continue to make important contributions to communities, institutions, the state of Oregon, the United States, and to the entire world. In acknowledging the origins, the original people of the land we occupy, we extend our respect to the indigenous people of Oregon and all other displaced ind indigenous people who call Oregon home. With this event and our collective activities, Critical Conversations recognizes Oregon's first people as the past, present, and future stewards of the land as we pledge our commitment to make ongoing efforts to center indigenous existence and related knowledge, creativity, resilience, and resistance in the work we do. Thank you all again for coming. Um, this conversation uh, really began in January of 2021. Uh, I, we sort of we organized uh, a program of 15 cultural producers gathered into three distinct groups to discuss how as curators, arts administrators, and writers, we had approached and witnessed curation deployed um, to contend with and to connect to the various forces at play in the world, their, our workplace and within our own minds during 2020 and moving forward. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna just read the names of everybody who partook and then we'll have an introduction from the folks uh, who are joining us here today in a little bit. Um, the 15 people who participated were Anna Sheffa Carlson, Ashley Stahl Myers, Ian Gilsdorf, Chelsea Couch, Grace Cook Anderson, Julia Rodriguez Windholm, Libby Warble, myself, Mariana Ramirez, Mike Bray, Peggy Candelan, Roshni Takor, um, Roya Selmarne, Sophia Maurice, and Yael Amir. And what I'm going to be doing is in the chat, I'm going to have uh, a link to everybody's full bio uh, in a Google Doc. So you'll be able to see that. Then I'll do that here in a few minutes. You know, and as we begin to re inhabit our cultural and public space this year, uh, we thought it was a really great time um, to check in with each other about what we had experienced in the curatorial field in 2020 and what kind of moving forward we wanted to bring with us. Um, so that'll be the, the fundamentals of the conversation today. Uh, I also wanna mention that uh, this event is the culmination of the Ford Family Foundation's 2021 convening program, which also included Unbound, two kaleidoscopic conversations facilitated by Sharita Town that reflected on how current Oregon, or uh, Oregon arts ecology support or don't support Black, Indigenous, and artists and audiences of color. Uh, and in another program um, titled Questioning Success, Reading and Thinking Together, facilitated by Bean Gilsdorf, uh, there was a group of artists with curatorial practice who responded to William Dershowitz's latest book, The Death of the Artist, and How, cre how Creators Are Struggling to Survive in the Age of Billionaires and Big Tech. Um, this con these convenings are part of an interwoven work led by the University of Oregon uh, with collaborators at PNCA, PSU, and Reed College, uh, which is supported in part by the Ford Family Foundation's Visual Arts Program. Uh, convening support Oregon and cultural producers by seeding discourse and stimulating communities related to exhibition making and exhibition making and arts writing. Um, there's programs that happen throughout the year, and each one kind of has.
the participants uh, uh, from all of these events are, uh, you know, Oregon artists, exhibition makers, writers around the state. Uh, and then the other two uh, programs that I mentioned earlier, Unbound and Questioning Success, will be included in Figuring, which is a publication produced by the Critical Conversation Series and the Ford Family Foundation that will come out in May of 2021, uh, which features writings by, on, and about Oregon's arts ecology. Super excited about that. Okay, now we're gonna jump into this. Um, and everybody in the conversation is going to introduce themselves quickly and then we'll jump into some questions within the three areas that came up in all three of our conversations. Uh, and just really quickly, those areas will be lessons from COVID times clash scale. Uh, how should we slow down going forward or should we slow down going forward and social justice in the art institution. Um, so before we jump into the first question, I would just ask the panels to uh, unmute themselves and introduce themselves. Uh, and maybe we can do it by uh, everybody picking the next person. So I'm going to start by asking Roya to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Roya Amir Soleimani. I am the Artistic Director and Curator of Public Engagement at PICA, which is the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art on um, unceded Chinook, Cowlitz, Tualatin Kalapuya, and um, Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Lands. And I am uh, also an educator at Portland State University in the MFA Art and Social Practice Program. Um, and I wor work a lot in other community capacities. And I will pass it to Yael. Uh, my name is Yael Amir. Uh, I'm an independent curator based in Portland, Oregon. Um, I am also currently the 2020-2021 uh, Curator in Residence at the University of Oregon Center for Art Research, um, and I am also an educator. Oh, and I'll pass it on to Ashley. Hello, I'm Ashley Stoll Myers. Um, I'm an independent uh, curator and writer based in Portland, Oregon, um, and I'm also an educator. I work at Reed College and also teach in a low res MFA program at Sierra Nevada College in Lake Tahoe. Um, I will kick it to Mike Bray. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Mike Bray. I'm an artist. I'm the co artistic and executive director of Ditch Projects in Springfield, Oregon, and I teach at the University of Oregon. I'm going to kick it to Mariana. Everyone, my name is Mariana Ramirez. I'm the director of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at Portland State University, and I arrived here this past December um, 2020. I would now like to invite Sophia to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Sophia Maurice. I'm a student or a grad student at PSU. Um, and uh, MFA studio practices, and as well as I'm a curator at Litmus Plus White Galleries, um, as well as I um, am a part of SHED, which is a, uh, we raise funds for marginalized, black marginalized artists, um, as well as um, we just started a residency this, um, this, uh, uh, this upcoming spring, free. I can go. Um, my name is Roshni Thakur. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am an artist. I graduated from um, the MFA Art and Social Practice Program at PSU. And I am currently um, working at the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon as a cultural organizer. And I will pass it to Grace. Hi everyone, I'm Grace Cook Anderson, the curator of Northwest Art at the Portland Art Museum. Um, and I will pass it on to Bean. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Bean Gilsdorf. I'm an artist and I've been writing about art and culture since 2008. And I'll pass it to, who's left, Chelsea. Hi, I'm Chelsea Couch. Uh, I'm an artist uh, based in Eugene, Oregon. I'm also a co-executive and artistic director of Ditch Projects and an educator at Willamette University. And then I think that might be all of us, but I could be wrong. I think so. Okay, so that takes us right to, um, you know, lessons learned from COVID scale time. And, you know, we had a lot, this was like a thing that just came up in every single conversation of, of course, like, 
what was it about this moment uh, that kind of came forward, right? And COVID scale and time referring to like the kind of large and the small, like the how big everything suddenly seemed, things that we used to take for granted, and then also how insignificant some parts of our cultural work seem to feel uh, during COVID. Uh, and also the sort of vastness of the sudden access um, that we had as we encountered cultural institutions making their programming accessible online uh, to such a, a huge degree. And so, you know, there was a lot of talk around uh, ambition checks for curators, um, how everybody has been leading with compassion in this time, um, and, a, and a lot of other types of, of pieces of that around intentionality. And then uh, I think one of the uh, participants in the kind of lead up to this conversation was asking, what are some of the experiences of organizing exhibitions and public programming that we had during the COVID years? And what have they taught us? Uh, and what are the benefits that we might want to carry forward? Um, and so we know, we know access being one of those, but we also know that access is, is, not, always the, uh, is not always just about putting something online. Um, I can go. Uh, this is Yao. Um, I have uh, been organizing a couple of exhibitions this past year um, as part of my residency at CIFAR. Um, and I think that the um, definitely the ambition check was something mm -hmm. that um, I experienced. Um, it's always like, how do you how do you reach how do you reach the biggest audience? Um, uh, the non-art audience, uh, how do you give access? And then like, there's this um, also obviously huge responsibility for um, public health and how do, you, how do you respect everything that's happening now while also pushing things forward? Like you could cancel all exhibitions and then, you know, there's no art to see for a year or you can do things in a different way at a different scale. And, um, and I think that for me, what I've noticed is the benefit, the benefit of that as bo both an audience um, member of exhibitions as well as an organizer of exhibitions this year has been that I've had more time actually to spend with the work. I mean, it's been very controlled because you have an appointment and you go and see a show and you, know, you have like 30, 40 minutes, but it's, there's like a lot of, um, you can, you can spend that time. It's almost like more precious. Um, everything, like I've never, I will never take for granted going to see an exhibition ever again, probably. Like this is a, it's gonna be a huge hangover, I think for just for a really long time. Um, so that, that was my insight from the year ongoing. One thing Yael, that I really enjoyed from our conversation that you made me think about was that, um, you know, we, I, you know, think about it, especially in my last staff, I had several working mothers um, that reported to me and it was a struggle, you know, trying to, you know, get them, you know, to have carve out um, space for them. And you had mentioned um, uh, that one of the, the positives was that you were actually able to attend like a lot more events now that they're virtual, you can go home, start a dinner, watch an event, and that you were able to actually participate more so than in the pre-COVID time. So I thought that was an interesting um, positive that I hadn't thought about before, because um, really we were struggling on a lot of um, the other, you know, the negative aspects of it. Um, I would say that for, for us at Ditch Projects, um, particularly, like, I think in a lot of ways, like, we kind of started as a, as a space in an effort to kind of create community. And even though online can really kind of make community happen in a lot of ways, in a lot of different ways, it didn't really have the same kind of, um, it didn't, I guess, like, it didn't fulfill it for all of us, you know, and I think it definitely was like a struggle in some ways. And it was a struggle to kind of like, you know, I think like, like in a way we're an institution that kind of likes to, to work shoulder to shoulder and be together a lot. Um, and, and we kind of like, you know, like flow off of each other's energy. And so there we tried as best we could, but it was interesting how difficult it was to kind of like 
to maintain what we did previously and like kind of have the same energy and and have everybody kind of just you know like we're, we're a space that no one's really being paid we're all kind of you know volunteering time and and we get everyone kind of gets something from it by being together and by being part of the community and it kind of was hard to re recreate online But maybe also add that in addition, since we have started reopening for appointments uh, in our space at Ditch Projects, that just to kind of echo the first two comments, we feel like there's like a lot of accessibility that comes along with what we've learned in the past year and the ability to attend a lot of events and, you know, finding space for people to interact and participate in conversations and shows that may even pre-COVID not have been able to in the same capacity, whether it's geographic or accessible. Um, but as we've started holding appointments, I guess just to echo what you said, Yael, people are, are saying how nice it is to actually see something in person. And I feel like that was one of our big takeaways from the conversation that there are all these wonderful ways we can carry over um, access, but there is something that is truly so remarkable about being in the same space with work and everyone that's come through and had 30, 45 minutes by themselves with an entire exhibition has just been blown away by how impactful it can be to not only be alone in a space, but to physically be present with work, maybe for the first time in a year. Yeah, I think that's such a great point. I'm one of the things, um, you know, following a kind of social media closely during this time of, the museum closing when we had that first opening and um, folks were posting about the museum, the, it was very different. I felt like the um, experiences were a lot more personal and deeper. And I certainly think being able to have a whole gallery to yourself, um, having that space um, really offered this kind of um, just a more uh, personal or intimate experience. Um, that I think was really wonderful to see. Um, I think in other ways too, um, you know, one of the first things that we did, of course, immediately was to try and be responsive online. And one of one of our thing, one of the things that we've sort of pivoted to was um, all the curators doing kind of these daily art moments on on Instagram and and um, Facebook. And I think what's been wonderful about that is it's offered us some opportunities to um, revisit things that are in the collection that um, are not on view. And it's also helped us kind of um, do a little study in, into our own collection. In some ways, it's kind of funny because it's brought us back to um, some of that more traditional um, mode of working and kind of discovering in within the collection that's been really wonderful. Um, and the other thing for us too is, um, certainly just being more responsive um, and offering more of our personal voice in, instead of this sort of anonymous sort of curatorial voice. Um, and that has been, I think, a really gratifying experience. I don't know how that will kind of carry through post, you know, when we go back, but I hope that, um, you know, we, we have been talking more about, you know, institutions um, should be more human centered and, and what does that, mean and how how do the voices change um so th i think that's been really interesting to think about i can build off of that a little bit with pica um like many other institutions we were forced to um you know cease programming and uh close our doors for several months in the early in, in you know the the first period of covid and um that really forced us to think about how the space could though in the interim be used and we turned it over quite a bit to mutual aid groups um, for all kinds of gatherings and meetings and efforts as safely as possible, um, especially uh, from June onward. Um, but the uh, the focus remained um, this question of how do we how do we still realize our mission and support artists and their practices right now in a responsive way. Um, and that meant a range of things. For one, it meant paying artists even if their projects were postponed or they chose not to continue them. It also meant um, having dialogues with them about what they really have the capacity for 
And if they couldn't just shift something online, and we do a lot of performance curation as well as visual art, but if they weren't ready or didn't have a desire to shift to digital platforms, that was okay too. And so um, that th their engagements looked different or they may not have happened yet. They'll happen in the future, um, but the commitments have remained. Um, but we also, there was much to mourn. We, um, you know, we had staff who were on contract or hourly who we could no longer keep employed, um, uh, at least for some time, if not if in some cases have not been able to bring them back. That was heartbreaking. And we learned, a, we've learned a lot um, in that, in that um, uh, experience of um, what it means to, to be an institution that has power and has resources. And yet suddenly we have to um, spend those and, and um, distribute those differently. Uh, so it's meant a lot to examine um, what curation means relative to sort of a redistribution of resources and wealth in these times. Yeah, thanks for that, Roya. Um, that was also uh, a similar experience to what I had and I was waiting because I didn't want to be the bummer. <laughs> I didn't want to be the bummer person to contribute to this question. I could be the bummer. We're in it together. Um, so for me, I had like a really funny suspended year in that I opened an exhibition at the Alabama Contemporary in January 2020. So um, I got to, that was the last time I've been on a plane. I got to fly there. I got to make it. I came home pretty quickly. It became clear that, you know, people were really sick and this was like really going to be like a, a global thing that people were paying attention to and things needed to halt and not be the same. Um, so it was this weird suspended moment where that exhibition ended up being up for a solid six months because it wasn't safe to take it down. So it was this really weird suspended moment of like, there's this exhibition up that no one can see because it's not open for people to see. Um, it's also not safe for preparators to come take it down and return the stuff to artists. And so it was this really weird suspended moment as a curator thinking through what my practice looks like in physical space. Um, and what ultimately came out of that is that my practice this year has not existed um, in a public way. Um, and when I say that, what I mean is that um, as Roya was just mentioning, I very much think of part of my curatorial practice as being not just a creative, but like a hardcore administrator and resourcer um, who's thinking through what artists need to be able to do what they do and make what they make. Um, so 2020 for me turned completely inward into resourcing work, which I don't think of as being wholly separate from like a curatorial practice. Um, I sat on more grant panels and COVID relief things this year than I've ever sat through in my life. Um, it was a way of still weirdly seeing art <laughs> in a strange way um, from people just telling us a little bit about their practices and what they needed. Um, but yeah, instead of having like a public facing practice that existed in physical space, it's all um, sort of behind the scenes resourcing work in a way that I think is was really valuable and that I'm really grateful for. Um, I actually think Oregon did a great job sort of pivoting uh, the sorts of funding that's available in the state to be, um, you know, relief funding for folks that were struggling in various ways. And um, it's been really cool to think about, and it might, it's my desperate hope for Oregon to keep thinking in this way um, about what resourcing looks like and about what sorts of um, arts funding is available and what it looks like to apply for that stuff. Um, because we had to sort of change the rules about that a little bit this year in a way that I think was um, really beautiful and important and necessary. So I hope as we move forward back into a little bit of normal normalcy, we sort of retain um, some of what we've learned as administrators and resourcers in the way that Roya was describing about what that needs to look like. That's great, and and I think like if we, if if out of this there was that, that sort of like mental shift, and then the shift within like funding operators, uh, the way foundations operate too, uh, to have like that kind of lasting impact and that compassion and flexibility, um, and a kind of realization too that projects don't wrap up in a grant period. Um, 
like that, that those would be an amazing things to kind of carry forward. And I feel like too, this, this conversation is starting to dovetail really great with the second part or the second topic, which is around this idea of slowing down. Uh, should we slow down going forward? Because you really can't have the kind of reflection uh, that you're talking about at the kind of busyness breakneck speed at which um, we have often tried to operate within. And we all actually all tried to operate within when this all first started, uh, you know, kind of like get everything online as fast as possible. We have to have some content. Um, and so thinking about, um, you know, this question that came up in the, the conversation about slowing down and what that might mean is, you know, how, would, how could we remain timely and critically responsive uh, without feeding into the narrative of more and now, uh, and of course for free, uh, and how can we sustainably support one another while extending uh, compassion to ourselves and probably to our audiences? Um, okay, I'll go. <laughs> I'm always the first to go. Sorry. Um, I I think that uh, the that if something really valuable can come out of this is definitely yes. Like Ashley and Roy are talking about the accessibility aspect. Like there are huge takeaways from this year um, that there's just no going back from from and from how I view it. Um, like, how do you now start complicating the grant process again? You know, I mean, obviously it can happen, but like, why would you do that if you went, if you opened it up and found a way to, to, um, to provide grants by leveling the playing field in that regard? Um, but also in terms of slowing down, like, why do we need to do so much? I mean, there's so much to do, but like, why, like, like why everyone who knows who works in this field, to talking about it from a perspective of an administrator, um, knows that like there's always so much more to do, and and you never do enough. And did that work for us in the before times? You know, like can we just take have a, the takeaway be that we can slow down and still do really meaningful work and serve the our communities in different ways. Um, that now we see what is might be as valuable as putting up an exhibition of their work. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is what has been required of us and of the institutions that we work with um, from a funder perspective, you know, and like can funders just maybe roll it back a little bit and say, okay, you don't have to do five exhibitions a year. You can do two exhibitions a year and have more artists and pay or pay the artists a lot better and do ongoing programming and have bigger access to the community and broaden the access to a broader community. Um, like how, how do you just go deeper now um, and, and see things a little differently? I echo that, Gael. <laughs> and I also, I, I think the slowing down is, um, you know, this is all part of like this economy, this nonprofit industrial complex, just like all of these bummer kind of things that we're in, but we're producing um, that aren't, that aren't really real and necessary and so like working for your communities and working intentionally that um it actually strengthened our muscles um my collaborator and i we were very fortunate to receive funding and we had to strengthen our muscles about um talking to the funders about like what it was realistic and what was like what is the priority right now and like do we really want to do like everybody's in like in a zombie mode, <laughs> like, do we really, are we, does this make sense right now? Um, and so that is something we're definitely carrying through. And I think that like, I don't know, I, I just thinking about this past year and um, I would just love to see, like it was a moment, it was a, a learning 
experience of like actually meeting people where they're at. And so they're instead of like having these abstract concepts of who our audiences are and who our community is, is actually like getting in the ground. And I'm, you know, I am an organizer and I also like work at a social justice organization. So there's resources and support for that. But I do think that like art institutions can expand into the methodologies of organizing and having um, organizers on staff so that <laughs> instead of like worrying about audiences, actually like meeting with people and working with people um, to um, build community and to, um, continue the the missions and the support for the art institution as well. I, I think that the um, the pause has both forced us and enabled us many of our institutions or those of us within institutions or those of us working adjacent to or um, in collaboration with institutions to actually do the the real examining and some of that deeper work that both the IL and Roshni have mentioned um, around critiquing and unpacking and undoing these systemic you know um, nonprofit industrial complex kinds of issues and problems that previously were so often just panel discussion content you know that's where it ended it was intellectualized and aestheticized and um, never actually and never actualized and so now um, we have this opportunity and also this like external and call to action and this shift in internal mandate to um, really think about how it might be possible to radicalize or get as close to radicalizing institutions as possible, because that may be impossible because nonprofits are far from radical um, platforms and entities, right? So I think um, what for us, uh, actually, you know what, aside from PICA, I'll say, I'll recommend looking at a document that Creating New Futures, a group of dance and performing artists and arts administrators um, co-authored and, uh, and it, it's still an active collaborative with open access. Um, that, uh, that group came together and um, in response to a number of artists in primarily the dance world being told um, right after COVID lockdown happened, that their projects were just outright canceled. They hadn't been paid for any of the work that they had done up to that point. They had no contracts. They had emails and conversations with curators and arts administrators, but nothing that they could legally lean on to um, protect themselves. And they were all freelancers with no salaries or incomes, right? Um, and so they came together and said, this is untenable. This is unethical. How are we going to work coll collectively as arts workers across the spectrum of anyone who works in the arts in whatever way, shape, or form to actually reimagine what it's going to take to build a different kind of mode of operating um, that that is in fact ethical because if we if we do look back at like the thing we don't want to return to we could arguably say it is truly unethical the way that we were working wasn't right um and this has been the this has forced us to have the space and time to act to actually advance something different forward even if we're going to fumble along the way Rhea, I want to build off what you just said, because I and and what Rashani said, because I think that um, as somebody who isn't actually in an institution um, but works with a lot of institutions, I've been actually really proud of a lot of the things that people have done at the at institutions that I've seen um, in Portland and in Oregon. And I think that there are different fasts and different slows. Like instead of just saying like oh, we wanna slow down, we don't wanna, um, we don't wanna to move too fast, we were moving too fast in the past. Like some fast is great. Like the, some of the pivots that institutions made um, to reallocate funds and things like that, like they were, um, they were really important and they were done really well, I think. And, um, you know, um, putting things online, making things more accessible, that all happened really, really quickly. And again, like it was fantastic. And what I was really excited about, about that kind of fast is that it showed me that institutions, some of which we think of as rather hidebound can pivot. And that's exciting. Like, oh, you can do it. Um, which means that we can hold those same institutions accountable later when they say, oh no, we can't change that fast because they can, right? Um, and Rashani, I think that goes to what you were saying about like more activist methodologies 
um, and having some kind of flexibility. Um, and so I think, um, Mac, when you introduced the question, you said something about, you know, still being timely, being able to be timely and, and to um, meet the challenges, even though like we're taking some things slower. And I think the question for me is like, it's not really whether to be fast or to be slow, but it's like, is this the normal that I want to go back to? Or is there something better? Like, aside from time scales. Yeah, I would love to see our institutions become more process focused in a way that Roya was describing. Um, we're so very focused on like objects and materials and end processes or like in ending results when, um, you know, I feel like at in its soul, um, art is about process and how we get there and the conversations we're having along the way and like what that, um, you know, what creative thinkers and makers are engaged in before they like actually get to the stuff. Like, I think that's why we're all even here in our hearts is because like, we're interested in that. Like we're interested in an ecosystem of like creatives and thinkers that are like, what else? Um, and so I would love um, moving forward for um, institutions and funding and the different ways that that happens to be increasingly thoughtful about process and to compensate process and um, to not be so worried about what the end thing is going to be. Um, I shouldn't say this as a curator, but like not everything needs to be an exhibition. Um, that was something that I felt really held hostage by this year is like, how do I like make an exhibition in an environment where an exhibition is not possible? And for me personally, the answer was that I don't. Um, and I don't feel bad about that. Like, sometimes the the result of a thing just needs to look like something else whether it's a conversation whether it's other sorts of resourcing um whether it's just like a public gathering of some sort to like try to make a thing happen um and so that's something i want to see carried forward by folks that have the resources to sort of um keep the the arts ecology of oregon uh, moving and funded is like, let's think more about the stuff that's happening along the way and how we support it ethically and um, make that return to making that the important bit. Mm -hmm. Ashley, I appreciate that so much. Um, and just thinking about that idea of that exposing the process and talking and being more open about the process is also being more transparent as an institution. These are the things that we're going through. These are the steps that we're taking and come along with us, right? Um, I think more of that is certainly something that we've been thinking a lot more of and kind of, um, you know, certainly being more vulnerable to in a lot of ways, um, that aspect of transparency. And then, he, and then the other thing in, in curation is um, this idea of kind of, yeah, the finished product, the exhibition. But um, I think this time has been so wonderful and forgiving in the sense that it's okay to fail and make stumbles along the way and have tech, technical glitches and um, all of that. It's all part of, um, you know, what we're trying to get to. Um, and I think, I, I would hope that there would be more less of that kind of the sheen or the or the mask that often kind of um, takes over, um, but more of that exposure um, to that process and, and just being transparent as an institution. Um, and I also want to add that idea of the time of slowness and um, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, the museum pivoted too with um, speeding up um, with our artist funds and offering relief grants, um, but also, you know, democracy and doing equity work is a really um, hard process and takes a lot of conversations and um, it takes a lot of um, making sure we're all on the same page in, 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 in the institutions. And it's, it's the kind of work that's worth doing. Um, that's not something to rush through and often comes to a place, um, results in a place of thoughtfulness. Um, but I just wanted to add that in terms of thinking about that time. Can I go? Um, actually, oh, uh, I actually have a question. Um, for everyone. Uh, 
what would a decolonial process of um, deconstructing their relationship between the curator and the um, and the artist, and when it comes to uh, the hierarchy that has um, that is embedded in the process, and how do we um, how do we bring more self-taught um, artists into galleries? How do we um, create a relationship with um, the community, as well as honor the land um, that we're that we're taking up space on? Yeah. I'll repeat something that you said in our session um, that well, you were like, at the bare minimum, just pay people. Like, at the bare, you know, first baby step, just pay. And that, but, you know, there's so much more to do. But that is being definitely one of the, I think, at least from my journey from uh, Florida to here, it's something that I've seen grow a lot in the past five years is this more, you know, not even just like a little pittance, but actually like sitting down and when we're constructing budgets, thinking about let's do less so that we can pay someone an appropriate amount for a you know two hour workshop or something versus sort of like let's have five workshops and everyone gets paid you know $75 per workshop you know these kind of like really like nitpicky things we did you know a few years ago has kind of changed a lot so I think that's something really great that you you had brought up when we spoke as a small group. Well it like I think a lot about slowing down but to me it's like we're at this point where it's we're in decline and so what's what's different uh, a process that is decolonial and how but what does a decolonial process when all we know is hierarchy and so um, to me understanding I hear a lot of the time like there's this separation between a curator and artist but no it's the same thing <laughs> um, and so I'm curious as to how how um, do we strip um, that business mentality um, from that cur the curatorial role because a lot of it is just like marketing. <laughs> I don't, um, that's at least from a student perspective, a student curator perspective. Like I come from where we don't have a lot of funds. We weren't paying artists. We weren't taught to pay artists. We didn't have trauma informed training to deal with the community. Um, and to me, that's the same thing in within institutions. And so. Um, and that's a large part of the problem because capitalism. <laughs> and so, and so, like I've been listening to this conversation, and to me, it's like it's um, all very fluff. And so, what is the nitty gritty? <laughs> I love that question, and there's not like a imperfect answer. Um, but I think first thing I want to say is all, that all curatorial practices look different. I think an independent curatorial practice is much different than being like a salaried institutional curator. It's a completely different hustle with completely different stakes and completely different dynamics in those, those conversations with institutions. So I think, yeah, all curatorial practices look different. All administrators approach that work differently. Um, so just sort of unpacking like the, the relationship between artist and curator can get pretty complicated because they don't know that like all curators like do a, a thing and like engage with artists in like a particular way um and I don't I also don't the other part of like decolonizing the process is that um I don't even know that audiences are ready for that and so it's a bigger conversation than just between artists and curator or just between artists and institution um Maybe that's I'll, the problem. Yeah, it's part of the problem for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, um, don't get um, embarrassed. Yeah, Elle and I made like the anti-biennial biennial in 2019 that we tried in some ways to like think through what you're describing. Um, and I would say a lot of people were like not into it. Like children wrote wall tags and <laughs> that was like, really poorly received by some folks, you know what I mean? And the intent was that we were like thinking about audience and like thinking about like who is art for and like whose voice is being featured and like what is an art audience and like how can we sort of, you know, democratize that in some ways. And like, it wasn't 
the reaction that we got for that wasn't all um, what you would expect. Like really, truly some audience were like, this is not what I want out of a biennial because a biennial feels like a particular sort of thing. So like, um, I think that goes again with the process. Like, I guess, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what you did, but um, to me, like, uh, I know that, I think I went to that exhibit or exhibition that, and, um, and the placement of it is already in a marginalized community, a gentrified community. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's the relationship with the, <laughs> the community and uh, what were the bodies that were coming in to this space were, that were complaining about it? Were they a, a part of the community? And um, I don't know. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think your question's a great one. I think there's like only complicated answers and only complicated things to like try and fail at on our road to like decolonizing that process. But um super stoked that that's where your mind's at. Because oh, it's just to me matter. like that when it comes to like my the work that I do and that I have to the processes that I have to take that's the main thing that's the main problem is just paying paying people what they deserve and um and I'm not even being paid what I deserve and so um how do you com combat that and I don't know um I wonder if um we might think in more specific ways about what we, I love this question, Sophia, I'm very glad you asked it, but what do we mean by decolonization? Because it's not an interchangeable term with equity or uh, inclusion, right? Like all a lot of buzzwords that are employed. I think it's um, our umbrella, because to me, words are hierarchical as well. And so when it comes to equity, that's reparations. I don't know, to me- it just Yeah, seems actually that's what I was gonna suggest that like, um, to my mind, uh, like true decolonization work that moves beyond say a land acknowledgement or, um, yeah. you know, a revised pay scale or fee schedule for artists would um, actually include a reparations plan for funders for nonprofit institutions, for other entities, right? And that would be to um, Black communities, well, specifically Black Americans and descendants of enslaved people, but also Indigenous communities, right? And then in turn, um, a, a, like actual plans around land back or rela and relationships with the people whose land you are on specifically, not just generalized urban Native populations, but the people whose land you we are on. Yeah, exactly. um, all of those things entering into it so that we are mindful of the ways in which the term decolonization is sometimes used. I, I mean, this is this is a popular concept now, but like used as a metaphor, right? Sometimes when there are actually specific ways we can be actualizing it together. Uh, thank you so much for asking that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I just, I don't know, to me, this problem is pretty simple. <laughs> and so, um it's connecting uh institutions and institutions to the social justice movements uh as well as connecting um as well as giving agency to students as well as children <laughs> um and creating those spaces um as well as um land back but it, like I, we cycle the, the conversations to, oh, um, when it comes to decolonization, but what is the next step? What are we going to do? What's the plan? Um, yeah, when it comes to when it comes to curation, um, because to me, curators have a platform. I have a platform um, and to, it's as simple as an idea. And also, it's always though like the. I think a lot of people in the space too have had experiences of feeling like you're doing good work that points to other alternatives and other ways, and at the same time, it's never quite enough, um, and we can't kind of like rest on our laurels and the institutions you're called out, um, and we saw that a lot this year. Um, you know, institutions who I would think even have done some really great work around um, being mindful and doing work that you might consider um, 
within the realm of decolonizations, if not actually. Um, but of course, it's not enough. And so there, I'm always interested in like how we recognize success as well as failure, um, and then support the people who are doing work, not just in um, a kind of performative way, but like having them over for dinner um, and giving them hugs kind of way as well, because I feel like that kind of work um, is sometimes overlooked um, within what, what administrators are doing too. And I think a lot of that has to do with like starting with your institution, like looking around at whose land you're on, what what's carved in your marble, um, you know, like how how did you come to be um, owning this building? Um, yeah, and all those things. Those are just great places to sort of start digging into this work with. Yeah, it also like starts with understanding the history and the, understanding the history of colonization, um, particular because the institutions were built to eradicate um, indigenous peoples and remove them from their land. And as well as looking at the history, particularly of Portland, um, which has strong ties to um, white supremacy and um, the KKK. Um, and so uh, land back would just mean handing over institutions, but that's, was that gonna happen? Um, I don't know. That's where I say we get into that issue of like, there's these really, really radical calls for action, or maybe what shouldn't be th thought of as radical should just be thought of as like, that's what you do, right? And um, where I see uh, thing, where I see things freezing up, you know, um, uh, where, where I really question whether um, institutions as they've been established, are going to actually take those steps, because as you as you just said, they weren't set up to, to really be progressive in those ways. Um, so I, 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 I'm, yeah, I, I wonder, I don't know where my faith lies, they're going to do it, whether, whether it's going to follow through and it might be individual actors working together collaboratively, but like across and outside of, and not just within their contained, you know, institutional spaces. Uh, yeah, I agree. I I guess to me, it's just, it's like a conundrum, like as a curator and an artist, um, how do I consider the community um, as well as how do I um, be a good collaborator? And I don't know, it's, to me, there like there's just this real brick wall between progress and um, doing something that we keep doing um, that's just that um, it's just destructive. Yeah. There's a really interesting thought in the chat that I hope some folks can address or say something about. I can read it or Amir, do you want to read it? Sure. I was trying to be quiet in the chat. <laughs> Um, I just said I think about decolonizing the application process to shows and grants as well. Um, what if we went beyond writing as the only mode of applying? What if we allowed narrative storytelling via video to talk about your work? Um, I think Northwest Film Forum is doing that in Seattle, working on decolonizing the grant process. And this is me just having written to artist applications. And I'm like, God, if I could just tell my story like it's so much more dynamic to be in front of a camera and like you can feel my excitement more than if I'm like typing um and I think you know my I'm uh part Egyptian and there's like you know you tell a lot of stories and it's loud and you use your hands and you communicate with your eyes and that sort of thing it's so hard to get across like my enthusiasm in writing sometimes <laughs> you know so I just I just think about that so I don't want to go long here but that's so cool thank you I agree, that's very cool. And while I haven't seen that yet, I haven't seen what you're describing yet. Let's see if we get some of that this year because that would be cool. Um, I have seen other ways that grants are sort of rethinking what they look like. Um, in this COVID moment, I saw a lot of grants sort of reduce thresholds of 
like a particular pedigree to be eligible, which was really, really cool. Um, not asking for resumes, not asking if you've got an MFA, like not, not, yeah, again, asking for that sort of um, pedigreed logic and like whether or not um, funding and resources apply to you. So um, like I said earlier, I think Oregon did do sort of a cool job uh, this year, uh, thinking through that stuff as fast as they can. And we still have a ways to go, but um, I did see like this much progress towards what you're describing, which I am also excited about. I also want to be mindful of the time and just see if there's any other questions or thoughts from people in the audience who want to engage. Um, feel free to just unmute and chime in or raise your hand if you'd like. Um, just ripping off the uh, this conversation, but also the um, the last chat that came up. Um, it's true that the conversation always happens between artists, between curators, um, between administrators, but that we're not having the conversation with funders in the room. I mean, there's funders in the Zoom room, but we're not talking directly. I mean, there's a lot of conversations that happen behind closed doors. There's a lot of like, can you give us feedback from your experience of reviewing applications or applying for things? Um, but really, you know, like we, we all talk about how we need to, more resources, we need to pay, and that leads to more equity as well. And, you know, like we're not the ones writing the checks. And if that's what we if that's part of what we need in these in these times, then can we have this conversation with the people who are writing the checks um, and making the changes there? And, and not to say, I mean, funders do ask for feedback, but it's um, uh, the changes. I, I mean, I, I was in conversations about this like 10 years ago about how things need to be more responsive, slow down, we need to lower the threshold for grants. We need to have video applications. I mean, that is a conversation that I literally was in 10 years ago that people can apply with a video and like these things aren't happening. And I don't like, how do they happen? How do they happen? Not to pass, pass you know, the responsibility on because it's on all of us. Cause we're also, we're in such a position of power of reviewing these applications. And you know, like we, you know, like we also have to lower our threshold when we review the applications to what is, you know, what 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 um, has merit for funding, you know, as the you know people being invited to it. But but you know, there is that bigger layer that we keep talking about the funders that we just never never have in the room in these kind of conversations. I wonder if, um, you know, like within this room where we do have a lot of arts administrators and curators and others who are serving on a lot of panels, you know, we could all take away that our feedback when after serving on a panel should maybe always include something like, why aren't there video applications here? Uh, you know, and like, hey, I noticed that your criteria was really a little uh, intense and white supremacist. Um, can we can we you shift that for the next time that I do this with you? Um, I think those. I mean, like if we said that every time and like multiple people were hearing that, like there would be changes. Like they would have to change, right? Maybe. Yeah, I think saying no is also part of that. That's something that I'm slowly learning, and I'm still not good at it. Um, but it's something I'm slowly learning. Like saying no when an opportunity is not appropriate or not on the up or not something that you would be proud to be a part of because it's not equitable or well resourced or whatever. Um, I think there's also a lot of power and a lot of us starting to like turn down opportunities because we're like the tokenized person on a panel or because we recognize that the pay scale is kind of trash or because of whatever else. So um, something I'm slowly trying to like absorb and embody and implement. And I think, um, yeah, powerful to think about as a group what it would just what it would look like to say no to some stuff. 
No, and I think um, actually, actually, it's, it is one of those things where we would, to some extent, work work together. It's hard when, it, you know, you're right. We say yes to so many things on like a dollar budget, and everyone's scrappy and works, you know, seventy hours a week to like make a funder or somebody's dream come true, so that that they think that that's normal. And then the next organization, it's like, well, this one did it, or you know, or when you're doing applying for grants, saying like, oh, with your, you know. $10,000, we're going to put on these 20 programs when it's, you know, you're killing your staff and, uh, you know, not having meaningful connections. So I think it's also, to some extent, a uh, collective slowing down or, um, you know, because it's really hard when we're, you know, there's the standard that's, you know, able to make it happen and, um, you know, we're not able to. I also appreciate Megan Atia's comment that the video could actually also create a new group of disenfranchised, um, that there is a way that like a video application will always maybe be um, like, could somebody with like super slick skills, I mean, it is sort of similar to writing, but there is something much sexier about video. Um, so maybe it's audio responses. I think it's more, I mean, I, I say video as like one thing that was brought up, but I think it's just like expanding the options more. I, I agree, video would, would also exclude people the same way writing does. But I think that having, you know, and then also as that, it's like you're asking a lot of the panelists when there's a multitude of, um, of, uh, of ways of reviewing the application. So, you know, like how do you also make that more um, easy and accessible? Um, it's a what huge about, question. Okay, what Go about, um, <laughs> what about the, uh, how many exhibitions you participated in? Um, uh, can that be deconstructed? Curious. Yeah, you can just not ask for a resume. Yeah, no resume. I, no, I think be about it could just be about you and what the work the work that you make. I like. I really think a lot like by project and not by um by project proposal and not by history. Um. Yeah, I think this also a little bit gets into like this breakdown that we've seen maybe in all of Oregon, but particularly in Portland of like, what sorts of opportunities are for emerging artists? What sorts of opportunities are for mid-career artists? And like these funny little brackets that um, folks are really dedicated to that are that are problematic. Um, yeah. And so um, I think that that's also an important conversation for all of us to have uh, with funders. Um, again, particularly in Portland with the closure of so many uh, different kinds of scrappy institutions. We've really lost a rung in the ladder that would help someone from being like a young artist get to a place of even being a mid-career artist. There's less places for them to show. There's less resources um, to really get their studios going to a place where they would like graduate to being the kind of artist that's pedigreed for a certain kind of resources. Um, and so I really like that thought and like thinking through what it is to sort of break down those those categories in a granting process. I was away for just a few minutes because my internet cut out, but I just want to say I love that this conversation is happening and some of these practicalities that we're digging into that could be changed, shift really quickly, you know, the culture and the, the, these ways of of operating. Um, and uh, to go back to something I mentioned earlier, I think that um, in tandem with grant applications and decision-making processes in relationship to that, there's the um, contracting process. And maybe this touches on what Sophia brought up around curation. There is that transactional piece between curator and artist or the institution and the artist around what that agreement looks like. And can we rethink what it says in writing and what that feels like to go through that agreement process and can it be flexed and can it be um, morphed over time and be a responsive and emergent process as well um, and one that doesn't feel disempowering and doesn't feel like it's set in stone. Um, I think 
that that's another way of thinking about sort of the documents that are produced that um, that uh, define the these power dynamics and relationships in the field that need to be um, really tossed out entirely and 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 rethought. I want to be aware of the time, and I just want to like leave it open for like any kind of final thoughts anybody might want to share. Um, as we as we close this out, Actually. well, then maybe um, we can kind of leave it on that closing note that Roy just had, which I think is actually uh, both uh, poignant and hopeful, and you know, like pokey, which I think is good, which I think is what um, art and curatorial practice should should be offering um, pokey hopefulness um, to kind of get us to some next, some next set of truths and um, some next set of justices, perhaps. Um, I'm so thankful that you all participated in this experiment, this convening during COVID. Um, I'm so glad you all came. I really want to thank Brian Gillis and Laura Hughes uh, and Megan Atia, who are um, you know, just such a backbone of creating these types of programming. Uh, Stephanie Snyder and Sue Taylor as well uh, for their work on the figuring publication that'll be coming out in May. Um, I think it's it's exciting things, um, and I and I think it's a responsive organization. Um, and I think these types of conversations and us coming together uh, can do a lot. And I really appreciate the leadership you all um, have here uh, within, within our arts community. So with that, I'm gonna say good night.